So we're here today at Buckminster. I've come to have a tour of the Cold War nuclear bunker and I'm here with... Richard Knox. Richard, can you tell us a little bit about the bunker? Yes, it's actually a Royal Observer Corps post. Uh, It's on the edge of the old airfield at Buckminster and uh, it was one of the many posts that were set up originally in the Second World War to observe for planes coming over for bombing raids and that sort of thing. Uh, But in the post-war period, of course, the period of the Cold War, the biggest threat was nuclear attack. And so these guys would be down on the ground if anything actually happened, if the bomb did drop, and they'd be recording what the uh, conditions were outside. But they're living in this solid concrete bunker with essentially what's like a Stevenson screen on top. But Jed Jaggard, who's the man who's uh, restored this particular bunker, can tell you all about the bunker, who can give you the complete lowdown on uh, on how the bunker was used and Jed can talk about how he's refurbished it. How long were they down the bunker for? Uh, well, they work in shifts and they're, 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 they're almost like a little team. Well, they were a little team of people. It became almost like a family. So where uh, some chaps might sort of spend their time in the potting shed or in their garden shed reading whatever and doing whatever, um, these, these guys and girls used to spend their time as their little team um, preparing for nuclear attack should it happen. But it wasn't all sort of doom and gloom because they actually had a, you know, a fun time as well. You look very much the part today, anyway. Well, I'm actually representing the uh, Royal Naval Fleet Air Arm. Because what, what we're trying to do today is not just talk about you know, the bunker itself, which obviously is the star of the show, but also put it in the context of the Cold War and the British Armed Forces, but also the civilian services we're doing as well. So uh, Nick Marshall's here today dressed as a civil defence volunteer. So he's got a load of stuff, you know, from search and rescue gear to um, medical gear and all this sort of thing. So there was, a, you know, vast numbers of civilians are employed by the government in case of, of national emergency. And, of course, they were used as well. So in 1953, there was a huge storm surge on the North Sea, and the Royal Naval Fleet Air Arm had their, their new whirlwind helicopters deployed on both sides of the North Sea, um, trying to help flooded people. And, of course, the civil defence would be called out as well. So it's almost like the version of the National Guard, but they are civilian. Buckminster was used for various things, because obviously it was it was developed, I think it was even developed in the First World War, Buckminster mm. Airfield, uh, and I think it probably saw all sorts. So were these bunkers manned permanently for 24 hours a day? I think they were, if there was a period of likelihood, I think they were manned permanently, otherwise they'd just do a shift. Mm. They'd go down, they'd train a lot, but again, as I say, talk to the chap that actually did it, and he'll, he'll give you chapter and verse. Hello, uh, Jed Jaggard, and I'm custodian of a hole in the ground. You are, Jed. It's a very interesting hole in the ground, though, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. It's a, it's a Cold War bunker. Um, this particular one was built in the 1960s, uh, and it would have been sort of uh, one of the main defence lines of Britain should we ever find ourselves in a nuclear war. What is it that actually inspired you? Because you've actually refurbished. It was an empty shell, wasn't it? It was an empty shell. It had been flooded. It had been fire damaged. There'd been a tramp living down there. And it was one of those things, you know, when you start something and really think, why have I bothered here, really? But it was a complete accident. I was actually looking, doing some research into the Melton Royal Observer Corps during Second World War. Found the post, and that led me on to the Melton Cold War post. And uh, oh, some holes in the ground might go exploring, could be exciting. Got in touch with the landowners here, which is the Tollymash family, and uh, said, do you mind if I have a look down? No problem. And it was then that I came up with this crazy idea. I thought, well, actually, I could perhaps renovate this place. So being rather cheeky, because if you don't ask, you don't get, I said, do you mind if I have this hole in the ground? And after a few weeks, they came back to me, uh, quite puzzled, as if to say, why would you want it? And said, yes. The, the bunker itself, they were all originally crown property. The ones that were stood down uh, right at the very end of the Royal Observer Corps' existence in 1991, the land reverted back to the original landowner because they were completely decommissioned and the Corps disbanded. Obviously, I had to explain that I wanted to uh, open it up as a a historic site uh, to get some interest in the Cold War, uh, use it for educational stuff, so we've had school groups and scout groups come down to it as well. Um, And, uh, yeah, Richard has been very supportive. Big question... How much has this all cost? Well, uh, fortunately, I have very nice friends who've given their time for free. I've got uh, my father, Neil Jaggard. He's give him a mower and he's happy. So he's done most of the vegetation on the top and all the rest of it and cleared back there. Done a remarkable job.
Um, my mum is always happy to help, Julie Jaggard, you know, like today with pigs and coffees and everything. Um, and cost-wise, uh, it's sort of a case of calling in favours, rummaging through skips and all the rest of it, trying to find the bits that I need uh, and putting it all together. And then through my own business, which I run, seeing the occasional thing on eBay that I think, ooh, that's quite nice, and uh, buy it. There are more items which I need to source to put into the post. However, the cost of those at the minute is uh, way beyond my budget um, because they're very rare. So there's that which I need to invest in in the future. Um, But all the things in there are authentic, would have been used by the core. The other thing as well is is it's not authentic to the Bookminster post. What I'm trying to do is make it a generalised post to talk about the core as a whole rather than a specific site. Have you thought about asking for some funding from the lottery now? I have. The problem is most of the heritage lottery funding, you have to meet certain criteria, conditions, you have to match fund and all the rest of it. How much money are we talking about do you need to finish the project, get it to how you would like it to be? If I wanted to get it, um, I would probably want about 10000 That would get the rest of the post instruments, uh, rebuild the aircraft spotting post, clear some of the area um, as well as its trees, replace the fencing and all the rest of it. And if people want to donate? Um, they've just got to come to an open day and put a few pennies in the jar and that is support enough for me. So we've got this open day today. Have you got another one planned? for? Yep, yeah, we've got an, uh, another one coming up in May. And every time uh, there's been a massive improvement since the last open day and hopefully there's going to be a massive improvement on the next one. So what is the rarest thing that you're after to complete your project? Um, I would very much like a proper radiac meter for the post, which is it's part of a, uh, an instrument called a fixed survey meter, and basically it sits on the desk and it measures the level of radiation. That is something which I would very much like, and possibly something called a bomb power indicator as well. We've got a mock-up down there at the minute, but they're very expensive pieces. Of How much were we talking? How much was that? Um, there was a, a fixed survey meter, a, an early one from the 1960s, which went on eBay a few weeks ago. Uh, starting bid was £600, went for over 900 So not in this month's wage packet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you for sparing the time Thank you very to much. talk no to problem. us. Um, brilliant. Well, I wish you all the best. I'm really Thank looking forward much. to going down there. Thank you. The Buckminster Post is currently open two days a year. If you're interested in visiting yourself, keep an eye out for the next date on the website. And the website is jedj.webstarts.com. I'm now going to catch up with Jed and the other visitors down in the bunker. When the government realised that, obviously, nuclear war was coming, they wanted to measure the the power of bombs, their radioactive fallout, and the best people to do that was the Observer Corps. They could be trained um, quite easily. Uh, Their role as aircraft spotters had massively diminished, but there was such a number of them pushing 20 to 25,000 volunteers at any one time, they were ready there. And the other good thing with the government is they didn't actually have to pay them, which made it a great idea as well. They got expenses for doing things, but they didn't have to Each observer was actually enrolled under the Special Constables Act. Um, and so as part of that, they were given constable's armband with Royal Observer Corps stitched onto it in red. They were given a lapel badge as well, and that's all the uniform they had to start with. And what they had, initially they had um, a height projector and that was their most sophisticated piece of kit and just before the second world war through world war ii and up until 1958 when most of them went underground and it was a plotting aircraft although depending on where you were in the country depending on whether you got that particular instrument if you were somewhere like scotland so not too near the coast of europe where the threat was coming from they had a map board and what they did to plot is they put local landmarks around the side. So Fred's Hill is X high, and then that's about a thumb distance from where we are, so four thumbs distance, that's the height of the aircraft type thing. And those continued into the Second World War as well. So they did a test bunker down in Surrey uh, to see if it would work. And the principal did, 
uh, and so they started to build these across the country. Not always on their old uh, observed course sites, some were brand new, uh, some were in the same location, some were slightly moved to make the instruments work better. So there were 1,600 built across the country in clusters of either three or four. Now this map here, part of a map taken after 1968, and as you can see, they're all in triangles or squares. We're here, which is post 62. Uh, we've got the Grantham post number 60 and 61, which is born. Each post is up to about 12 to 15 miles apart. And the information from three posts is then used to triangulate uh, and where all the three points cross, that's where the bomb went up, basically. So they can work out from there. The instruments, depending on the size of the bomb, a bomb that hit Sheffield would probably register here still. The information then is fed into the respective groups. So this area here, the information is fed into Lincoln Group. Uh, some of Leicestershire feeds into Coventry, some of it feeds into Bedford. Uh, it's all split up in time. And these regions are roughly the same regions as the regional government, because if nuclear war came, we'd be under regional government, and the person who was in charge of it was basically a dictator. He had power of life and death over anyone. Um, so if you didn't get on with him, chances are he'd have you. I don't know why he was. <laughs> um, but um, they went underground between 59 and 63, the building programme was. As I said, this one was built in 1961. The stand-down for the Royal Observer Corps was in 1991. Some were closed in the Strategic Defence Review of 1968 uh, under the then Labour government, and half were maintained and kept on. Some were closed in the mid-1980s. This one lasted up right up until stand-down. So there's not people down here all the time. There is a call to man the posts. Now, in times of national emergency or crisis, you would get given the order to man the posts. One of the, the closest times that the world came to nuclear war, which was the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, the posts weren't actually manned. Although, uh, there is a training film which was made, curiously, in October 1962 by the Crown Film Unit, which is of various bunkers, posts and all the rest of it being manned. Now, it may have been uh, a rather useful cover because everyone was down there ready to do their job but that's only speculation on my part. However, the closest we came, Britain's weapons were stood down with 18 minutes to launch. So that's how close it, it really came. Where this particular post is, because of the local targets, the local targets in 1962, and we know this from released files since the collapse of the Soviet Union, we've got Grantham, which is then the biggest logistics core de depot in England. Nottingham, principal city, uh, Cottesmore, North Luffenham. Cottesmore had Vulcan bombers in 62. Uh, North Luffenham had Thor nuclear missiles. Melton Mowbray had Thor nuclear missiles. Loughborough was going to be the regional seat of government. Uh, and so basically anything within that area is just toast. Depending on where the post was, depended on whether it would survive. This one wouldn't. Um, of that, I'm fairly certain. At the very least, the top hatches would have just gone with the experiments that the Americans conducted and the ones that the British um, would later conduct out in Australia, which is where we did our atomic bomb testing. We very kindly t tested an atomic bomb in the middle of the outback and then gave it back to the Aborigines. And then we did some more at Christmas Island. It found that most of the things on top, because it's just brick coated in concrete, would have just gone completely. All of our nuclear weapons, uh, we didn't have the privilege of bombing Russia. That was the Americans' prerogative. We, our main target was Kiev in Ukraine for V-bombers. So, yes, you could be down here. You, when you were given the order to man the post, you were down here in shifts of three people. When the first bomb went off, you stayed there for the duration, partly because there's no-one else to come and relieve you um, for a start, uh, but then you have to call in the information. In order to do that, you've got various instruments. What you've got, the first you know about it... This is a mock-up, um, so this is a mock-up. This is called a bomb power indicator. Now there's a little pipe which is sticking out of the ground. On the top of that there is a disc, and it's a bit like um, you know, a kid's windmill that you get in a sandcastle. It spins that, the air pressure comes down the pipe, there's uh, like a, a bellows system in there. It compresses it and the needle moves, and that tells you how powerful the bomb is. This is when the world went metric in kilopascals. Originally it was pounds per square inch. 
So that would move. The first thing that you would then do is you would call in um, to say that a bomb's been dropped. So the call sign to say that a nuclear bomb has been dropped is toxin, your post number call sign, uh, and then the time that it was registered. 30 seconds after the last significant blast, number two observer leaves his seat, opens the door, goes up the hatch, opens the lid, out of the hatch, closes the lid. Next to the hatch, there's a little black disc. On top of there, there'd be, it looks like a white biscuit tin, basically. And inside there is photographic paper with various lines on it for north, south, east and west. The flash from the bomb would then project a spot onto the paper. He would take that out, put it inside his um, slip. There's two hanging on the wall just behind you, sir. One of those. Put the fresh photographic paper in, put the lid back on the biscuit tin, uh, called a ground zero indicator, screw it up, open the hatch, crawl down, close the hatch, down into here. So, depending on how powerful the blast is, whether there's another bomb just gone off, uh, and which direction the wind's in, chances are he's had a pretty good dose of radiation. Uh, you come back in here, call where the plot is on the horizon line, um, you know, for which direction it's in, and then your job after that is to call in the amount of radiation in the air. Now to do that, above here, there's a, the pipe goes straight at the top. Above that, there was a, like a dome shape. And what would be up there is uh, it's basically a radiant meter. And it measures the amount of radiation in the air. And there'd be a telescopic rod under here. You pull down and you read off. You see them, like on this one here, he's got the telescopic rod. The wire comes down to the table and plugs into the little device there, which is one of these. Um, sitting on there, and that measures the, the radiation. This particular version on there is one that you could also use as a mobile unit because some observers in here, to get more information about the radioactive fallout, they would actually have to leave the post, get in their car, and drive towards the bomb, measuring the radiation. And to protect you in that, you're given one of these. It's a, uh, a dosimeter or a dosimeter. These were standard issued to the Royal Observer Corps and the Army, including those in the Warsaw Pact countries as well. And basically, um, there's a little, on the base of it, there's a little um, range, if you like, and once it registers, you've had a dose, come back, get out of it. The problem is the scale is so big on here that any registration on there means you've probably had enough to, to certainly cause severe sickness, if not kill you. So when you come back, the first thing you do is you put it in a recharging unit, which is here, and it puts it back to zero so you can reuse it again. That's if you're still alive. That's if you're still alive. When they did scientific tests into radioactive fallout, they reckoned that if you went within five miles of a nuclear blast up to five weeks after the bomb had actually dropped, you'd still get enough radiation to kill you. Britain's biggest problem, I mean, Russia wouldn't have hit all the targets in Britain. We'd have shut them down, or, but some would have got through. If they'd have hit all their targets, there'd have been nothing left of Britain because there are more nuclear targets per acre in Britain than in any other country in the world. Because we're so densely populated and the amount of military hardware that we had at that time, most of which was far better than anything the Americans and the Russians had. You know, Britain, for example, was the first to develop stealth technology. It was the first to come up with the idea of silo technology for hiding missiles. You know, things like the Vulcan bomber, uh, the Victor bomber in-flight refueling, that sort of thing. We were the first to do it. We were also the first to come up with a, a jet bomber, the Canberra. Um, Britain was miles in front of everyone. Britain's biggest problem, though, never had the money to complete the tasks. Whereas, obviously, Russia and America just poured money at it like water. Um, and we just couldn't afford to do it. So, yes, uh, when you're down here, you've got your... There's two water containers down there. There would be five. Um, and that gives you your supply of water. There's also a petrol can down there as well for, for cooking but initially you cook on these Tommy cookers. This one is actually an original from this post. These haven't changed since the early 1900s and they were still being issued in 1991 and basically the base comes off, you open up the top, set the lock fire to it and then put your kettle or your pan or whatever on the top like that. You have supplies down here. Initially there were supplies that you bought yourself then the government issued proper ration packs that the army were given um, as well in tins, and that would be your food down here for the time being. This one's only got a single bed. Um, there'd be up to, as I say, up to four observers on at one time, usually three. 
Most posts had a bunk bed across the back as well. However, posts were customised to the, the people's needs. So, for example, the one over at Bourne had uh, plant plots, flowers, very flowery curtains. There were a lot of women in the post. Consequently, as you can see from that picture, which is the old observers from this post, there's no women in it, so it was a bit blokey. As you can see, the pictures on there are actually of this post when it was operational uh, in the 1980s. Can you um, tell me whereabouts the one in Grantham is? The one in Grantham, yes, I can. If you are coming towards Grantham from Melton, you've got the roundabout and the pub just before you get on the A1. If you go up, uh, if you go as if you're going towards the A1, but don't actually get on it, there's a turning right before you get onto the A1. It goes through some houses, follow it along that road, and it will be just out of the houses on your left-hand side. That's the Grantham post. So, yeah, these, these are the observers from this post. This one's taken in the mid-1970s. A few of the chaps are still alive. One of the chaps who's worth a mention is this gentleman here. Uh, his name's Rex Pollandine. And Rex, uh, he was um, an observer, um, which is basically the old name for a navigator in the RAF. Uh, and three days into the Second World War, Rex got hit, and so he had to make a crash landing. Uh, as a matter of course, then, you had to go through a medical. Went through his medical, found out he had rheumatic fever as a child, so he invalided him out three days into the Second World War. He joined the Observer Corps straight away and was one of the observers on the ships on D-Day. During the D-Day landings, various practices, um, various mess-ups and all the rest of it from other landings had shown that a lot of aircraft had been shut down in friendly fire. Some aircraft had come over and strafed ships and landings which were actually enemies and no one had opened up on them. So volunteer observers went onto the ships and they had power over the anti-aircraft guns uh, to direct fire. Rex was one of those and he was given one of the... Oh, and he, he was down here. The chap who's donated some of the things back to this post is actually sitting on the far left in the front row, Norman Ager. He donated back this mirror, which was the original from the post, the chair, which was the original from the post, uh, some of X members have donated things back as well. Um, the batteries, which this whole place would run off, which are actually sitting on the bottom shelf at the minute, they were given by a chap there from the Bourne Royal Observer Corps post. I was having a look round uh, for bits to put in here. Got in touch with the chap who owns the Castle Bytham post. Can we have a look? Can we remove anything? Yep, not a problem. The place had been fire damaged, so it was completely black with soot. There were 13 dead rabbits on the floor, a broken kid's bike. Uh, it was horrible, really. We went down, though. Uh, this wall mount for the bomb power indicator, that was there. Took that the handle off the sump pump to pump the, um, pump the water out from the bottom. There's a timer switch above the light switch on the door, which is actually missing its, its central piece. And that was so that the light wouldn't be left on when you left the post. There was that. The bed... Uh, which has been scrubbed and cleaned and repainted. And we were just uh, leaving when we said, uh, do you mind if we have your door off as well? Because so, ours had gone rotten, because this place had been flooded up to two feet. So we had the door. This was left over from the original post. This was actually still on the wall uh, when we came down. One of the things which was still on the wall and surprisingly still working when we hooked up the electricity is this bulb was the original and the bulb holder. So we were quite surprised when we found that it still worked. The two different lights, the actual, the brighter one of the two should be this one, and that should be done. Uh, and what you were doing is when you did your work, you did all your work off that, it used less electricity. The thing, though, 60s psychologists um, thought that you needed to give the impression that you'd gone outside, and so they added an extra brighter bulb in the post, and every hour and a half, you flip the other bulb on. Most observers went, yeah, okay, whatever. But that's what you were supposed to do, to give the impression you'd gone outside and all the rest of it. Because this should be really bright and light up the whole room. Before uh, I move on, does anyone have any questions? Yes. How did they keep warm? It would be freezing down here. Well, in the late 1960s, early 70s, they put polystyrene tiles all over the walls and ceilings. Ah. I have taken them off fire hazard, obviously, which was in theory to keep warm. Most observers didn't like polystyrene tiles at all, uh, so they gave them a solution of paint which would stop them being flammable. Uh, they took that with a pinch of salt. One of the other things that they realised as well is when they were down here, 
to actually communicate with the outside world, the old BT telegraph line, which went out through that pipe, then just connects to telegraph poles, which obviously would be the first thing to fall over in an English pub. So you can't actually talk to anyone when you're down here. If you talk to a gentleman when you get back to the village hall, Chas Parker is in the corner. He's an ex-member of the Observer Corps. He will tell you that he inquired about the communications problem and was told that the government had a contingency to bury all lines, uh, all important lines to areas within 24 hours, which is just rubbish. They just never have done it. I, I think if you're a building contractor and there was nuclear war coming, you'd be building yourself a bunker rather than worrying about telegraph poles, really. What I'd like to do before we finish, uh, it's a bit scratchy, I'm afraid, but it's made up of different components from uh, a training film by the Observer Corps. So if I can start that off and... Uh, and I'll explain what the missing things are. So that change in sound will be the warning. The air raid sirens go off, and they reckon you've got four minutes between the air raid siren going off and the first missile hitting the country. So you've not got long. Really. And in that four minutes, you're advised to build a shelter which looks something like this. Uh, this is actually genuine government advice taken from the uh, uh, little leaflet which is on here. Protect and survive. Um, protect and not survive, really. Mm. It's just a fabulous work of fiction. Now, if you wanted to save yourself, <laughs> you could volunteer as a telephone operator. So if you work for something like um, British Telecom, or anything like that, or the post office, uh, you could volunteer to do the work and you'd be nice and safe in the bunker. But even at, at the epicentre of a one megaton nuclear burst, the level of radiation within five miles is 20 times more than what it takes to kill something. Could be down here for weeks, is the problem. Um, and obviously the helpful advice such as these things like protect and survive and all the rest of it, you know, it's very sketchy information. And these were going to be issued free to all householders in 1981, 82, should the threat happen. But the advice actually hasn't changed since 1961. But uh, if there's any more questions in here, or anything else, I'm good. Russian targets, sorry, uh, because particularly in the early 60s, because the Russian guidance systems were rubbish and their planes weren't so good then, their theory was to hit the area with a really big bomb. All the bombs that Britain was using at that time, the main warheads, they were one tonne, one megaton nuclear. So they weighed a tonne, but they carried a one megaton warhead. So that's um, a thousand tonnes of TNT equivalent. The Russians were working on anything from five megatons upwards. So a bomb on Melton, if they'd have hit the target, the crater's 1,500 feet across, total destruction within two and a half mile radius, third degree burns in a four mile radius, anything flammable is likely to catch fire within a seven and a half mile radius. So, now I've cheered you up with the prospect of nuclear war. Uh, does anyone have any questions? And I'll attempt to answer them. Are they um, armed, were they? Do they have got any weapons with them? Or no. Because you'd think that, you know, if, if there's a prospect of a atomic... Someone would be trying like to get that. down here. No, they weren't armed. But the, the thing is with this, even if they did get down here, yeah. it's not proofed against radiation. Yeah. That's just fresh air coming in here. Yeah. So the dust just comes in and you get a belt of it anyway. To go outside, they experimented with nuclear, biological and chemical warfare suits. That's one... That's the early style, uh, late 60s, 70s. But they cancelled it on grounds of cost. Yeah. I mean, the observers were really at the bottom of the pile. Yeah. considering they were willing to give up. Um, but no, not armed. Some people may have brought a weapon down at their own discretion, because that's what they reckoned was the biggest problem after an nuclear war was the breakdown of law and order. Well, you'd shoot yourself up and starve to death, wouldn't you? Because you'd put down the yeah. food oh, down the, there, oh, there'd be nothing left up there. No, I mean, the best, the best place to be for a nuclear bomb is under it, mm. really, because yeah. surviving it is just, it's a nightmare. I mean, above ground, they reckon that a nuclear war soil up to seven inches from the surface, that all has to go, then you can start planting. If you want a really depressing evening, but a very um, informative one, you can watch something called Threads. It was on in the 1980s, 
and uh, it's America's version is the day after tomorrow, which is factually inaccurate and pretty rubbish. Whereas the threads is actually quite a, it's a very serious thing, and they reckon that one bomb on Sheffield. They did the maths and everything. They reckon that just one bomb on Sheffield, there wouldn't be enough supplies in the National Health Service to deal with that one bomb at that time. It's an air siren. So they've not changed since the late 1930s. Um, the national warning sound for Britain was that up until 1992. If you go to the Isle of Man and start a an air raid siren like that, they all run for cover because it's still a national warning sound. And this nuclear suit, how was that protected? Uh, you have nuclear gloves, you have boots as well, rubber boots that go on, you wear your gas mask, um, and basically the, it gets caught up in the fibres, essentially. It's carbon, isn't it? Yeah. It's carbon fibres. Um, so kind of and acts as a filter. It's because it's you have special um, identification drills, because I wore one in the airport, mm. and they're, they're difficult to get to the top of, roll everything down, and then put it up, and then you have to pad, it, pad yourself with... Mm. We've got actually um, in here somewhere. Oh, he's that's right. There. Exactly. Yeah. Here we go. We've got these things. Sorry, let me just flip the other light back. It's a bit bright. Oh, oh, you you take some paper yeah. as well. Yeah. You stick it on your. And deep that's right. Didn't you? What are these? These these are things which were issued as part of your nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare kit. That's pretty yeah. talcum powder, isn't it? It's called. Um, uh, oh God, is that DKP? DKP? There was a special name for it. But yeah, that's what you had to do. <laughs> and stop yourself from blowing orange. Did they work? Uh, they, well, the thing is, it, most things can act pretty well against fallout. When they did a fallout test on Christmas Island in the grapple test when we were trying to get a, uh, an H-bomb, which we finally did, Britain's biggest H-bomb was three... Hang on, let's get this right. Three megatons. Um, which... To save money, they dropped uh, not far off the end of Christmas Island. So what they got, got is everybody on Christmas Island, they moved up right to the other end of the island, turned with their backs to the bottom, put their collars up, pulled their hats down, covered their eyes like that, sat down on the floor all bunched, and then dropped the bomb. Well, some people, some of those people have since tried to claim compensation, and actually there is no evidence to show at all, there's no health deficiencies, nothing in their children either, to show that it had any effect. So even in that close proximity, the fallout hasn't actually done anything to them. It might be because the wind was in the wrong direction, we don't know. But nevertheless, they've not been affected. So possibly something like that, you could see where they were coming from with it. However, these things which the Army were expected to use, they were expected, and the Air Force and the Navy, they were in it all the time, constantly, whilst... You, know, you can remember people. wearing one of these. Yeah, yeah I remember wearing them in the Air Force, yeah, in Germany. On our tacky bars and, and everything. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's good. Yeah. It's, that's right. Rubber yeah, gloves and rubber boots. Full of earth, I remember that's oh, That's it, it? Yeah, yeah, full of earth. Yeah. Oh, that's the one. That's yeah. what it's called. Full of earth, that powder. Yeah, full of earth. With any radioactive um, material. Yeah. You just got this, it's like talcum powder, you just that's right. shook it all over your boots and your gloves. That's and right. just you go it through deep and it, soaked yeah. it up, any contamination, it just kind of, well, it's supposed to mm. soak it up, but it's never been really tested in anger, has no. it? Or no. Some, or some used of these ex, ex-observers still had gas masks from the Second World War, which they still used, and their only defence, really, apart from the gas mask, they got eye shields and gas oil, and that was it, to protect themselves, if they still had their thing. Excellent. Thank you for sparing the time to talk to us. Thank you.